The Red Mountain. In the beginning, my weak, tired eyes slowly fell open. This cruciating pain crept up my spine. The horror of darkness was all that could be seen except for a dim light glaring in the far distance. Paralyzed, I was buried in a sea of unknown fears. Where am I? Cold, burning sweat dripped from my moist flesh. The intense pain spread from my spine to every ounce of my trapped body. I was buried from the neck down in a pool of rot. It felt like melted rubber or maybe plastic, but it smelled like fresh death. A dark force stronger than gravity was pulling me down. I couldn't break free. If only I could see this hell that I was trapped inside of. The flickering light seemed miles lost into the midnight sky. Looking up through this cold, deep well, like looking through a telescope, I could almost hear my name echoing from the core of the earth. Sebastian, Sebastian, the faint choir of voices cried out. Panic possessed my every move, my every thought. I tried desperately to crawl out from the powerful grasp of this black hole of nightmares. Falling from the unknown sky, a cloud of flames began to float down the dark tunnel. The flames slowly swayed closer and closer to me. I could finally start to see fragments of my surroundings. This hole was much deeper than I thought. Perfectly round with massive white walls of thick bricks made from human bones. As the flame descended, the light revealed cryptic and strange writings on the haunted walls of my tomb. I couldn't read or understand anything written on these walls. Definitely a different language. These strange words and symbols were written in what looked like blood. Further down, claw marks, or maybe finger marks, etched into the bone walls. The cloud of fire instantly disappeared. What the fuck? Where am I? Impatiently, I continued to try to break free. Freaking out, I began to scream, hoping someone might hear me, but my attempts failed. For the next what seemed like hours, I drifted in and out of consciousness. Chapter 1 Rhode Island, January 31st. In the middle of a monstrous blizzard, 18-year-old Zack was coming home from a late-night party. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll to pass the time waiting for the storm to end. It was 3 a.m. Bored of the event, he stumbled into his brand new Hummer 3. As the Jeep warmed up, he pulled out a large bag of cocaine from a pocket inside his heavy black leather jacket. He emptied a few lines on the back of an old CD cover and snorted away. Peeling out of control, Zack sped off into the rage of the night. 
heavy snow piled onto the pavement at an extremely fast rate. Just 12 degrees and the unforgiving snow fell 14 inches an hour. It has been snowing like this for three days now and has no hope of slowing down anytime soon. Speeding recklessly down the highway, only a few cars on the road. Zack could barely control his driving. The headlights started to flicker like a strobe light before going dead. All the lights on the dashboard also died. No cell phone. No lights in the middle of the night. Zack pulled off to the side of the snow-paved highway. After about a half hour of waiting for daylight, he fell into a deep, morbid sleep. Like living inside of a dream, he visioned a large man at a dinner table, cutting off the skin of his children. Piece by piece, layers of skin was dropped into a wooden bucket on the floor next to the table. Zack saw five or maybe six children no older than ten years old. They all appeared to be dead. Their lifeless bodies lay battered and piled on the old dirty table. The enormous man hovered over the children as he decided which piece of skin to flay next. He strategically chose each incision of his rusted dull pocket knife. Each piece of skin that was cut had a Bible verse engraved under the skin. Children's blood oozing on the table like a fountain of evil. The old man began to mumble to himself. Louder and clearer, he became uneasy with cold, burning tears in his eyes. I must put the children in the well. I must do it tonight before the Black Witch returns. Dirty, thick saliva dripped from his quivering lips. His deep blue eyes turned red as his blood-stained hands. Grabbing another child from the pile, he would read the Bible verse etched in each piece of flesh that he filled the bucket with. This old rugged man was born as Jason, a preacher most of his life until the black witch entered it. Now, 63 years old, he is somehow completely programmed by this dark spirit. Jason was devout to his family until his wife died of stomach cancer. Leaving him with their six children, his godly world became dark and painful. This is when the black witch first appeared to him. She comforted him mentally, emotionally, and sexually. She became all he had as his children slipped further and further away until it was too late. The more that she influenced Jason, the more he forgot about the young children. The children were never fed and they grew into starvation. Five girls and one boy age ranging from four to nine. Zack was looking on from another world. His eyes absorbed the grotesque visions pulsing through his every thought. Unable to speak, he continued watching these children being butchered by their own father. He was lost and confused, 
stuck in an in-between world to see, to feel the cruelty that these children had once suffered. The potent effects of the cocaine in his veins had worn off immediately. For the first time in years, Zack had to deal with this emotional horror with no help from drugs. Though he was sweating rapidly, he felt cold like his body was starting to freeze to death. His eyes filled with angry tears became heavy. He struggled to keep them open. For some reason, he felt the need to stay and find out what is happening with these dead bodies. Forcefully, his eyes closed, transporting him to a different in-between world. Centuries ago, and in an ancient forgotten place, hidden deep in the side of a mountain, a red intoxicating mountain, an abandoned woman was giving birth to a baby girl. Though in agony and the torture of her solitude, she pushed for hours, but the baby was stuck inside of her. A large transparent hand appeared in the form of smoke, reached between her bloody thighs and violently ripped the baby out of her womb, throwing it to the floor. The hand vanished the woman away with the blink of an eye. The baby lay screaming in pain. The Red Mountain breathed life into her newborn soul, naming her Isabella. Isabella would grow up to be known as the Black Witch. Cursed from birth, she only knew of dark and evil, though everything about her was flawless. She was beyond beautiful. Light, smooth skin that illuminated the moon. Long, endless legs of fury. Wild, curly blonde hair that hugged tightly to her body. She was never one to wear clothing. Even in public, she was known to walk around naked and natural. She turned 22 and stayed this age forever. She was blessed or cursed. Or maybe she was the curse. Maybe she was supposed to have died on the floor that day after being ripped out of her mother. Living inside this incredible red mountain, she seemed to feed on the heart of this place. The mountain gave her unique powers that grew stronger with each use. Blackness in her veins, and poison boiling in her blood, these powers have abducted her. Her powers given by the dark evil that she was born into. Since a young child, Isabella had a reoccurring dream every night. The same exact dream. A finger in the heavens would write a message in the sky. The crimson finger owned her dreams, drilling the message into her subconscious. Find Sebastian. Find him and kill him. 
offer his soul to the Red Mountain. She was very young when she began her search for Sebastian. She would see glimpses of his face flashing before her reflection in the mirrors. But she didn't know who he was or how she was going to find him. When Isabella turned 22, she was alone in her room to hone in on more of this power that has been controlling her. She locked her bedroom door, then sat in the center of the room. Naked as always, goosebumps covered her soft, cold flesh. Her hard nipples provoked the anticipation of the pleasures of evil. Thunder slowly crept in from afar with the roar of a million lions. Flashes of lightning ripped through the night sky. Her eyes, red as fire, flickered to the rhythm of the thunder. Heavy, cold rain rushed to flood the grounds. She began to chant her prayers to the darkness with soft whispers. Her eyes remained focused on the visions in the dark. Visions of blood draining from her body as she hung upside down from an oak tree. And visions of her future. Sebastian must die. I will destroy him, she convinced herself. As her morbid prayers of death filled the room, Burning flames penetrated from within her eyes. Immediately the bedroom filled with smoke as fire began to spread, looking for destruction. The locked door wouldn't unlock. She tried to escape the furnace that she created. Screaming for help until she had no breath left in her lungs. She was afraid for the first time. The door smashed open with brutal force. Flames are turning everything to ash. A voice from the doorway. This way, follow me. He pulled her from the mouth of the angry fire. She owed her life to this stranger, and she knew it. Are you okay? He asked as they ran out of the burning house. Is anyone else still in there? Gathering her thoughts. I think I'm good, thanks to you. I was home alone, and I must have knocked over a candle. Out of pity. He insisted she come stay with him and his family. She agreed, considering that she felt some kind of strange peace around this man. She didn't know much about peace, because her whole life was infected by this mountain. I'm Jason. You can spend the night here. Shower, eat, make any phone calls you need. Your family must be worried. He rambled as they approached his large two-story home. She had no family, but the mountain itself. Unfamiliar with the kindness of another person. So she blurted out, I'm Isabella, and I'm a witch. But I won't hurt you. I like you. Jason laughed under his breath in disbelief of this nonsense. Walking to the front door, she stopped to take his hand and lightly closed his fist. 
She told him to open his hand. Entertaining the idea, he opened his hand, revealing three large black widows crawling all over his hand. A devout Christian and a pastor for many years, Jason did not believe his eyes. Please, none of that, he begged. We will talk about this later. Please behave. Upon entering the house, they were greeted by his wife and six children. Isabella may have finally found a family. But it's too late. Destruction is all she knew. Chapter 3 Above the Well A large crowd gathered around the peak of the mysterious well, shouting and chanting in all different languages. They marched around the stone circle. The sun was just starting to rise over the gloom of the night. Slow, dance-like movements surrounded the well. About 75 belonged to this popular cult known for their ruthless sacrifices. When one of their own breaks the law, a child must be sacrificed for each charge to purge the sins of the people. Once a week, usually on Saturday evening, they all meet at the well to prepare for the sacrifices. The mysterious well doesn't want dead children. It only wants their flesh. This particular night, the skin of two children was required. They must please the demons that are hostage to this well. It was like this endless well was somehow alive with a hunger for power and a deep thirst for death. But this cult named Levivions loved and worshipped with pure hypnotic evil sworn to rid the world of the weak souls. The Levithions are dangerous, venomous creatures of the wicked night. Each member was gifted with their own special and unique power. Powers of fire, lightning, and even powers of poison. No two members had the same power or strength. As they continued to circle the well, the men, the women, and especially the children would cut their wrists and forearms over the mouth of the well. Their dark blood dripped down the walls, feeding the demons below. The leader, Nicodemus, silenced the congregation with a single shout. With a stern, deep voice. Two parents must choose to offer their children. This is difficult, but the crimes must be paid for. The members looked around at each other to see who was going to take the initiative but no one was eager to even move a muscle. Nicodemus cleared his throat as his words became deeper and full of anger. Then I must choose for you. He pushed his way into the crowd of people that he called his own, searching for the first child he would offer. 
his eyes finally fell upon the one. An infant asleep in her mother's arms was begging to be sacrificed. This one's mine, he shouted as he took the baby's leg and ripped it out of his mother's arms. The people began to cheer as their leader raised the baby above the well. Tearing the baby in half with his hands of steel infused with witchcraft, he threw the body halves into the hungry well. The mother felt saddened and ashamed, but she believed that she would be rewarded someday for her offering. I need one more, he shouted another warning. Deeper into the crowd, blood dripping from his tight leather gloves, pieces of flesh paint his white trench coat. The eyes of a seven-year-old boy met the stone stare of the colorless eyes of Nicodemus. He began to cry, screaming and begging for his life. The boy will be his last victim for the night. Nicodemus grabbed the boy by his long blonde hair, dragging him to the center. Out of his pocket, he took his small knife and began to slice large, bloody chunks of flesh and meat from the little boy's fragile body. Screams deep from the boy's soul as he was being shredded alive, piece by piece. The crowd cheered once again with praise in their voices. Some say, that the leader had gone too far. Each chunk of the boy's body was thrown into the well of darkness. This does not have to happen to us. We chose this. Do not sin and no sacrifice will be needed. Keep yourselves pure. We will all meet here next week. This was a different type of speech for him. He usually just says good night to everyone. He actually does not hate children, and he has always been a kind leader. He had two twin girls that he loved more than his own life. Years ago, the well tested his obedience and ordered him to sacrifice both of his daughters for the good of the power that the well of darkness brings. This is the ritual that the Levithians performed each week for centuries to come as each generation continues to feed the well. Chapter 4 Another In Between World Zack revived from his deep sleep by sirens echoing in his ears, was chained to a jagged stone wall, legs and arms spread apart. This seemed too real to be another dream. Deep under the red mountains hides haunted tunnels that lead throughout the undergrounds. Not many adults know these passageways. Tunnels spiral into themselves, creating a maze impossible to escape unless you know the exact layout. Old stone walls camouflaged by cobwebs paved each path to a different destination. Faces and riddles are painted on some of the stone structures. A thick liquid drips from the cold ancient walls. 
dark, long corridors led to circular rooms with thousands of burning candles and a wall bookshelf filled with children's books. The children of morning lived down here, always dressed in white. Their eyes were all crystal gray. There were thousands and thousands of them flooding these secret tunnels. Skin pale white like vampires, they had dark hair but no face. They look exactly alike each other, but no faces. A few of the main members of the Children of Morning slept into the dark tunnel that led further down into locked cells lined up in a row. Just past the empty cells, they entered a large room with very little light. Zack could barely raise his head to see the three childlike beings staring up at him. Weak, almost unable to speak. Who are you? Where are you? He anxiously asked. One of the faceless children stepped forward. We are aware that you met the father. He spoke in a soft, soothing, and hypnotic tone. Now we must show you so much more. We are counting on you to free the mountain of its curse. Counting on me? Why do you chain me here? What have I done to you? Zack snapped back at them. The little child reached out his hand. Relax, Zack. These chains are for your protection. You now shift between worlds so you can learn the dark truths that have been kept secret for far too long. We are here to help you. Zack was more confused than he could possibly handle. Who do I need protection from? Yourself. Now that you can shift, demons and spirits from another time could attach themselves to you, possessing you. This is a place of peace down here. We are pure. Then who is the father? He is the man that you saw chopping us up into little pieces. But I saw you die. I saw him dismantle each of you. How can this be? Zack felt a dark presence creeping in, but it did not come from the children. He did believe that they were in desperate need to help him. The child unchained his arms and legs, setting him free. We are the children of morning. You did not see us die. We are right here. What you saw was our former selves. Our former selves were killed and torn apart. Zack could not comprehend or even entertain the thought of this craziness. Just a metalhead from Providence who was in love with his cocaine. How could fate need him to do this heroic gesture? Through the hollow maze, they led him into the main room of the underground world. There were countless children that roamed these passageways. Though none with faces, they all seemed sad. For good reason. What am I supposed to do? Zack still didn't understand the riddle that has become his life. Come, sit here. 
I'm Fane. The boy pointed to a huge wooden chair in the center of the large open room. The mass of children gathered around him. Zack sat in the main uncomfortable chair, looking around this enormous place that has been concealed from the earth. There is an important man that we have been searching for. He is to come and conquer this mountain before more blood stains its peaks. But something happened. You see, there is a scenario of events that have happened. Someone knows the importance of this man and now wants him dead. Who is this man? What is his name? Maybe Zack was starting to realize how serious this was. He is called Sebastian. He is our only hope of survival. There is a woman, a dangerous woman with veins of witchcraft that also has been searching for him. Isabella the Black Witch. Blood began dripping from Zack's eyes and his body started to spasm, transporting him to another in-between world. He woke up what felt like seconds later. Looking around, he is now faced with the landscape around an old dark well. His red eyes following, slowly looking deep into the heart of the well. Haunting echoes and soft chilling cries can be heard like voices forever trapped in the painful past. It smells like rotten flesh, slithering deeper down the blood-stained walls of this well. His vision became blurred the more he tried to focus on the details. Zack became easily frustrated knowing that this episode might be worse than the last. Worse than the wicked father. The first thing that he realized was that the casing to the well was made of bone. Smooth, perfectly circular well with immaculate walls of human bones. Dry blood was stained into each brick of bone. Thick cobwebs hang by the thousands to illuminate the swarms of spiders. Centipedes and venomous worms also flood these walls of death. Deep, loud growls stormed from the bottom with thunderous waves of bass vibrating the fragile structure. Zack was getting freaked out by these visions. He was not afraid of anything in this world. But that didn't mean he wanted these insects all over him. He could almost feel the spiders biting him. His weak body began to convulse rapidly. Once again, blood dripping from his eyes, he instantly vanished back to the children of mourning. This time, everything was different. The children were all grown. The same kids, still no faces, but they were kids no longer. The tunnels of horror were now clean, new, and light shone into every corner. Drugs and alcohol were everywhere Zack looked. 
In the center of the maze stood six massive beings. Each of them were women eight feet tall and spread wings of angelic lust. Nude, glowing skin of these perfect forms of sex goddesses in heat. These naked women stand like warriors, always ready to protect and fight. But they are just a vision, just the name brand. They are here to guide us, to heal us, to tempt us. They are here to mate and to multiply. Upon the first glance, Zack fell in love with all six of these winged demons of beauty and chaos. But they did not seem to be too happy with him. With cold, evil stares piercing the soul, they approached him with sudden urgency. The woman on his left, long blonde hair, silky skin, and the deepest blue eyes, looked into his beating heart and asked, Do you want to know about your future? I can tell you anything that has yet to come. Zack pondered deeply for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, I think, think I, I do. Will, Will I, I ever find that shit? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, boy. For each detail that I give to you, someone must die. A random, brutal death for each clue or hint. Chapter 5 Veins of Loyalty Hidden in the warmth of the darkness, Isabella would escape the dread of the normal world from time to time. She knew very little about religion or God. She only knew of evil and death, nothing but blackness. A mystical atmosphere known as the Crimson Keep, hidden in the peak of the Red Mountain that was kept secret, kept sacred to her. Above, in the private mountain tops, she soaked in her solitude. Always searching for her inner sorcery to show her the way of pure destruction. She felt at peace in the eclipse of this ancient hideout. A large wooden cabin rests in the center of the eye of the mountain. A transparent veil of pain surrounded the lonely, immaculate shack. Though the thick air was hard to breathe in and was pitch black, Isabella could see the landscape perfectly. The old cabin was outlined in caskets alternating between red and black. Some of the caskets appeared to be empty, but most of them clearly had screaming voices coming from within. Alone in her morbid sick thoughts, pleasures of her naked body began remembering her puppet, Jason. She also could not stop thinking about her enemy from a different world, Sebastian. This turned her on even more. She knew that if she could not find him to offer to the cursed well, she would lose favor with the demons that occupy it. 
Centuries ago, Isabella built this well, layer by layer, shoveled and dug perfectly as ordered by the mountain. 200 feet in the depths of the earth, she gouged and molded it alone for years until the mountain was pleased. After digging the exact measurements required, she would gather the bones from her fallen victims over the years. She carefully sanded each bone to smooth out the rough edges. Making solid bricks of bone, she built a strong wall to enforce the strength of the well she had dug. She offered the well to the mountain as a gift of her loyalty. This well became the heartbeat of the mountain, directing the powers that filled the Black Witch. Since then, she has thrown many bodies, many souls, into the bottomless abyss. But this was not enough. She had to find Sebastian and end him for good, even though she didn't know why. No witch was as powerful as Isabella. She was untouchable, untamable. She was full of hate and lust. But even though she was using Jason to lure Sebastian, she had fallen in love with him in her own dark, twisted way. To test the loyalty of her beloved Jason, she requested that he kill his children to feed the well's hunger since they could not find Sebastian yet. He had no choice. Jason was hypnotized under her powerful spells that controlled his every move his every thought. Besides, he had become addicted to her sex, her scent of strawberry fields. She was frozen, fire, in ecstasy of electricity. Her captivating and intense sex is what kept him under her influence. Isolation in Crescent Keep, she began to remember the evil thing she did to destroy Jason's life. She lay on the cold wooden floor, naked and moaning his name as she spread her legs, touching herself, teasing herself. The very thought of Jason's horrid misery made her so wet. Lust filled her veins like waves of epic destruction. From the beginning, Jason and his wife Natalia grew extremely close and protective of Isabella along with the six children. One big happy family until that dreadful day. Eventually, Natalia grew jealous of the family's new addition. The way she was so free with her body. The way she would flaunt her naked soul every time the kids went to bed. As a wife of a preacher for almost ten years now, she tried to fight her jealousy, but it only turned into hatred. She brought these insecurities to Jason's attention many times, but he was slowly losing his willpower to the Black Witch. No one knew what she was capable of. She didn't talk much about her witchcraft after Jason shut her up the first night. Still exposed in the center of the floor, Isabella continued to touch her soft, cold skin. 
from her hardened nipples down between her legs. Waterfalls rise as evil pleasure gives release. She began moaning louder as the thoughts filled her empty soul. This night, Natalia was asleep in her bed alone. The silent and deadly witch entered the quiet room. Reaching out, placing her hand on Natalia's stomach. Whispering and releasing a curse of disease in her body. Isabella disappeared into the night. Natalia woke, screaming and sweating, pain beyond anything that she had ever felt possible, started to spread inside her stomach. She felt a cancerous demon eating her from the inside out. Each day the pain grew. Each day new symptoms formed, throwing out blood, twisted nightmares, and a stomach that was on fire. It took four complete days for the cancer to eat her entire body. Jason prayed and prayed, but the sickness continued. He had no idea about this curse. He just felt and believed that this was just one of those unfortunate events of life. Completely shattered, this was the last time that Jason talked to God. Chapter 6 The Scent of Evil Drifting back into his reality of hallucinating, Zack found himself bound inside of a straitjacket. White, ragged, and stained with fresh blood, it was way too tight and he could barely breathe. Crouched in the corner of a pure white small padded room, he heard voices and screaming from beyond the gray walls. Cockroaches, fire ants, and large black snakes also shared his room of torment. Blurred images paint themselves on the walls in circles like a haunted carousel. Images of demons, of angels, Images of graphic war between the two. More images of himself. Himself as a much younger version. A version he had fought hard to forget about. Zack grew up in a poor family. They only ate a few times a week. When he was five, his older brother tried to kill him in his sleep by tying a plastic bag around his head. Luckily, he was strong enough to fend his brother off. He ran away when he was 12 and never returned home. Since then, nothing but drinking and drugs and amazing chaos. He was the absolute life of every party. He would lie, cheat, and steal from anyone, everyone, just to get high. More darker illustrations on the walls reveal Zack as a fragile old man. His eyes were sewn shut. His mouth was slightly open enough to see that his tongue had been removed. The hollow voices from outside the room grew louder, screams of pain and agony echoing in his weak bones. Cowering in the corner, confused on what he was seeing, Zack stood to his feet. Moving forward, stepping over the massive snakes, insects crushing beneath his bare feet, 
He noticed that this room had no door. He began shouting through the thick padded walls. Where am I? Who's out there? Can anybody hear me? The noises of horror instantly stopped. Even the hissing of the demon snakes fell quiet. Silence filled the room with an uneasy scent of evil. The pictures and signs disappeared from the walls. The ceiling had a small tear in the center. From this hole, warm blood began to drip, forcing the hole bigger. Afraid to speak again, he paced back and forth from corner to corner. Zack felt that all this absurd nonsense would go away if he could just do a few lines. Cocaine was always on his mind. The silence didn't last long. Loud screeching cries like fingernails down a chalkboard and the sounds of chainsaws cutting through sheets of metal. Silence fell once again. The six goddesses appear on the wall in front of him. In unison, they spoke. Yes, you will find Sebastian. This will cost you one life. I will show you three faces and you will choose which one will die. Do you desire another question from us? Hell no. This is all just fucking crazy. Zack was not about to become a murderer. Very well then. We will only ask you once more. We are here to guide you. If you don't want our help, then we will find another. Now, you must choose. The voices responded harshly. Three faces appeared before Zack's tired and blurred eyes. The first face belonged to that of an elderly woman. Distorted facial features showed a life filled with much wisdom. The second face was that of a young boy, maybe five years old. His left eye was gouged out and scars were carved into his bald head. The third face was an image of grotesque horror. Dark, burnt skin covered half of his unrecognizable face. Blood oozed from the corners of his mouth. Zack had never seen any of these people before. Who was he going to choose? He despised this cruel game, but had pity on the man in the third picture. Maybe putting him out of his misery. I choose the third face, but make it quick. It looks like he has suffered enough already. The bright room turned pitch black for about five minutes. When the light came back on, Zack noticed that there actually was a door to this place. It was cracked open just enough to grab his attention. The straps and buckles from the straitjacket fell loose, freeing his arms. He felt nauseous as he approached the door. He slowly pushed it open with plenty of caution. The chosen man was standing before him. His lips were sewn shut with barbed wire. At the man's feet lay a small paper bag. Zack opened the bag to reveal a large butcher's knife. Zack had two things that he was thinking about. Cocaine, and the fact that he wished he could shift out of this situation before he had to do the unthinkable. He took the knife and cut the throat of this innocent man. 
the man wouldn't die, so Zack began chopping until the stranger's head fell to the floor. Screaming and burning tears, he slowly and painfully started to shift. But the shift had somehow gone wrong. His spasming body lay decomposing. Chapter 7 Sebastian Watcher and protector to many, father to the fatherless, I have always sheltered the homeless children. I walked the dark, angry streets of pain every night in search for the family that has betrayed me. Depression lived in my fragile, ugly soul. Sadness and death was the only story for me. Though I was 42, it looked like I was still 22. Coming from such a cursed Indian family, I was on top of the world. Until I turned five. My mother was raped and murdered by the pastor of the church that we attended weekly. I was the one that found her lifeless, naked body on the kitchen floor in a pool of her agonizing blood. When I was eight, my older sister killed the principal of her school for threatening to expel her for setting fire to the classroom. She will spend the next 50 years in a prison that protects her from herself. When I was 12, my oldest brother trapped me and buried me under the frozen snow for hours. Frostbite and panic overtook me as I couldn't breathe. This was one of many things that he did to scar my emotions. When I turned 15, I took my father's 9mm and shot my brother in the head for the years of physical and emotional abuse. I also took this gun to my father's head for the years of neglect and for not caring what the family has been going through. I shot him four times in the face. On the run, I fled to hide in another country, another world. I belonged to the night, to the darkness that welcomed my pain. Long, curly black hair, hazel eyes, always dressed in black. Hoop earrings spiral up each ear. Sacred tribal tattoos cover my entire body. Concealed in my many pockets, you'll find knives of all shapes and sizes. Though I had no life, no family, no love, I dedicated myself to the unfortunate homeless children that flood the streets each night. Chapter 8 the War of Blood Years before the Black Witch had built the evil well, the Levithions roamed the empty hills of the peaceful mountain. Generations came to pass with incest, breeding, and a dark sexual appetite for rape and for dominance. Hundreds of thousands of children were born out of this unnatural lifestyle. Most were born with physical complications or birth defects, and countless miscarriages had spread across the mountain. These children were gathered and put in an abandoned old church to keep them separated from the adults. The number of children grew daily. Locked in this dark church for years, 
They had plenty of food and water that was supplied by the adults. The church looked as if it were never occupied. Cobwebs drape over the entire ceiling. Chairs and pews were thrown upside down. Shadows came out from the walls and a silent threat became to brew. A large empty cross had been pushed over and broken in many places. These hurt, lonely children loved their parents, but after all those years of neglect, anger and hate began to control the minds of each one of them. Every night, they would hear desperate voices from the shadows that wouldn't leave them alone. The oldest boy, who had been there the longest, would chase these shadows around the church to find where they were coming from. He would listen closely to each word they mumbled. They called him by his name. All the children would hear this. Joseph. Come closer and listen. The voice begged for weeks. Wanting, needing answers, Joseph was finally ready. At the foot of the fallen cross, he noticed a small red spider waiting for him. Somehow, the spider spoke calmly and with high importance. It told him a story of great power that will change the world forever. Joseph's heart began to beat out of his chest as the spider continued. I was created a million years ago. I have taken on the forms of almost anything imaginable. I am not cursed, though I have cursed many. Gifted with the supernatural, I can make all things happen. You children have been locked away in my sanctuary. Your parents left you here to live their lives in one endless foul orgy of darkness. I have a curse that would help you all. Let me show you my power. Let us become one. Joseph knew that this must have been a dream, but a real dream that was trying to help him. The next morning, the children awoke to a peaceful atmosphere, but crying and moaning, they realized their faces were gone. All of them, just gray eyes sunk into their tiny skulls. They heard horrific noises coming from outside the church walls. Crowding the windows to see the commotion, Joseph was the first one to witness. The adults were on the ground scratching at their skin. Their flesh began to boil like being cooked by the morning sun. Blood exploding into thick pus dripped from their eyes and ears. Agony became the only sensation leading to the death of every last adult. The more they all bled into the ground of the mountain, the darker the stains of red had become. Tangible and visible, the mountain became the Red Mountain. Joseph looked on with satisfaction in his eyes, but a deep sadness fell over the children. They had become the curse. From the fall of the parents until the end of time, they were called the Children of Mourning, and they will forever be in deep mourning. Chapter 9 The Storm is Coming
endless clouds that boil with destruction began to manifest miles away, deep in the haunted sky. A warm, humid wind filled the atmosphere with unsettling presence of something evil. A dense fog brought in a light, misty rain. The storm is coming. With a full bucket of flesh, meat, and bloody organs, Jason rushed out into the calm before the storm. His destination was of course the well, which was on the opposite side of the mountain. He knew this wasn't going to be an easy journey. Sensing the storm in the air already, fate or God is waiting for him to condemn him for killing his children like a heartless monster. As Jason noticed the incoming storm, he realized that he must hurry to the well. Isabella would be proud of him. This is what kept him motivated. He was not an evil man. He had intense remorse for what he had done. But his thoughts were provoked by this dark, twisted love for his witch. She had become his god now. From his cabin, a brisk, nervous walk led him to the entrance of the cornfields, an endless three-acre maze, and it would be getting dark soon. He knew this maze inside and out. He was the one who built it, but it all seemed different now. He pushed through the corn maze, Careful not to spill the contents of the bucket. He heard children laughing with a haunting evil that sent nerves of ice into his spine. Shadows glitching in his peripheral vision caused massive waves of poisonous anxiety. As he drove himself forward, through the impossible maze, he felt as if he was being watched, being followed. Almost unable to breathe, Jason had one thing on his mind, getting to the well. An hour and fifteen minutes later, he could see the exit ahead. The ground began to shake and violently roar beneath each step he took. With the corn maze behind him, Jason was now faced with an extensive vintage bridge that was falling apart more and more each day. This is the only way to get across the polluted swamp. The journey had just begun. He must cross the bridge that led to the abandoned, possessed church. Then he must creep through the cemetery which leads to the evil well. Intimate thoughts about Isabella flashed into his subconscious. Her scent filled the air in his mind as he stepped on the first broken plank of the bridge floor. The anticipated storm was closing in. The humid, stale air grew cold and harsh. The bridge was about a mile long and he could not see the end from here. One step at a time, he carried his precious bucket with caution. The boards under his thick combat boots began to break as he shuffled across. The green, brown water was as high as the bridge, 
submerging some parts of the walkway. Cussing to himself, Jason rushed his pace, afraid that he might slip and end up in the swamp. He still felt that he was being watched from behind. Voices and dark twisted murmurs echoed on the lips of the wind. Shadows still forming and a storm that was about to wreak havoc. Fair compelled him to run the rest of the way. Exiting the bridge, Jason was soaked from the swamp covered walk. He made his way toward the haunted abandoned church when he saw a group of children playing on the front steps. They stopped and stared at him before speaking. Before the night is through, we will eat you alive. Paranoid, Jason felt like something was behind him, so he quickly turned around to see another crowd of children. He was surrounded. They each had rusted razor blades and began slicing the back of his legs one at a time, over and over again. He was thrown to the ground by his excruciating pain. The bucket of flesh and organs was dropped and spilled onto the church's grass. He needed to make it to the well by midnight. He was running out of time. It was probably already too late. The elaborate sky opened and rain began to penetrate the earth. The storm is here, Jason thought to himself. The shadows disappeared, then voices, the laughter, all silenced. Bleeding profusely, he managed to get to his feet. In desperation to get to the well. Gathering the spilled flesh of the pieces of his children, he was now faced with the cemetery. In total darkness, he walked where the dead walk. Limping through the graveyard, he saw demon beings peeking from behind each grave that he passed. Some of these dark beings reached out, pulling at Jason's bloody plant legs. He found the exit up ahead. In the large, empty, circular field stood the head of the well. But it was not alone. It was surrounded by thousands of the children of mourning. Chapter 10 Betrayal intentional gaze into the open sky. Isabella birthed a violent storm in the far away vault of heaven. All of her power, all of her magic was derived from her eyes. She forced this storm as a sign that she is in control. She almost felt stronger than the mountain that she served. But out of worship, she prayed to the Red Mountain with authority for what seemed like hours. Naked as usual, her body began to illuminate. Coming out of her state of prayer, she observed that she had been ambushed by the Levithions. Thousands of them, young, old, they had hatred in their eyes. They would grumble and murmur as they pointed fingers and scolded the helpless witch. Immediately. 
Immediately, Nicodemus emerged from behind her and tied a dirty cloth around her eyes, knowing that this was the source of her power. Screaming, her body convulsed into rapid spasms. Her naked golden flesh transformed into a green rugged physique. Her long blonde hair became coarse and turned the color of charcoal. A few of the larger Levithians restrained her arms and legs as Nicodemus came face to face with the Black Witch. We know what you've done, and we know that you are hiding him. Tell us, where is Sebastian? Fuck you! Do you know who I am? Release me, or I will burn you all. Though Isabella knew she was powerless without her sight. Nicodemus grabbed a handful of her hair with one hand, and the other hand held a large knife, which carved out her eyes through the cloth blindfold. One eye at a time, he removed the threat and placed the eyes of fire into a glass jar that he kept hidden under his coat. Empty words from a child. There is no time for your immaturity. You are the witch, the presence we've heard so much about. You are not important here. None of us are. You already know, there is only one who is important. Now where the fuck is Sebastian? She hissed in unrelenting pain. She felt her soul being torn out through her face. Short of breath, she cursed the demons that had created this mountain. She spoke with a shaky, weak tone. I've been searching for him for years. I was ordered to find him. I'm not even close. I don't even know what he looks like. What the fuck is so special about him anyway? Nicodemus seeked counsel with his most trusted circle of servants. No one could ever trust the words of a witch. She's lying. But then what do they do with her? Not falling for her deception, the clan cast her in a small cage meant for dogs, and they dragged her back to their compound which was miles away. But the storm was well on its way, with brutal force infested with evil. Isabella became enraged of the fact that the mountain was not delivering her from this hell. Her whole life she had not felt much physical pain. The mountain always had protected her. The pain that she did feel was those that mirrored desire and pleasure. But now she was vulnerable and fragile. The blood-soaked blindfold almost sliding off. She was doomed. She was forsaken. Her fate was in the hands of a hungry sect looking for Sebastian. They hooked chains to each side of the battered cage and began to heave and drag it across the punishing mountain floor. The hard ground and the sharp stones would tear the flesh of her toes and knees. Halfway back to their camp, the sky began to weep pouring down tears of death. Immense, powerful rain racing toward the core of the earth. The atmosphere became sour, 
and a cloud of depression swarmed the entire community of the Levithians. Grief and sorrow overtook their uncontrollable emotions. Deep down in her agitated soul, Isabella knew that her storm would slow them down, giving her time to plan her escape. There was something unhuman about Nicodemus. This storm seemed to have no effect on him. He knew what the evil woman had done, which angered him. His anger magnified as he watched his people suffer from her magic storm. His aggressive shouting encouraged them to fight the depression. The ground began to tremble with madness. Insects that lived beneath the ground ascended to the surface. Worms, ants, venomous spiders initiated war on the Levithians. The heavy rain was spiked with an acid touch burning the flesh of all but Isabella and Nicodemus. But the ground became dense, mud making it more difficult to endure being dragged across the mountain. Chapter 11 Inside the Casket More and more defenseless, Zack's vulnerable body was slowly fading away. Still in anguish, he could see things more clearly now. He could truly hear things for the first time. Zack took a deep breath, then closed his eyes, listening to the sounds of demons laughing. The sounds of angels crying. Opening his heavy eyes, he was running through a field of unkept shrubbery and tall weeds. He was terrified with fear. He was being chased. He was being hunted. Turning around every few feet out of nervousness, he didn't know why he was running. He didn't know how or why he was there. He didn't know what he was running from. Cold sweat puddled on his forehead. His hands were saturated and shaking intensely. He quickly headed left at an opening leading to the enchanted woods. He now could see far glimpses of who was chasing him. The Levithians and the Children of Mourning were racing towards him with pitchforks and chainsaws. He had recognized them from his visions of torment. Zack ducked behind some of the bigger trees to camouflage himself. Still trying to process these events, Zack felt something unfamiliar here. Unlike all of the other delusions, he was convinced that this one was reality. He truly felt fear overtake his entire being. Long, twisted vines and roots from the ground became animated, weaving around his legs and feet as he rushed through the forest. Fighting off the haunted trees, he pried himself from the evil grasp, deeper and deeper in. The woods carried an intoxicating scent. He didn't know this at the time, but it was the amazing scent of strawberry fields. The Black Witch. He quickly turned around as he exited the nightmare forest to see the swarm of chasers had disappeared, vanished. 
up ahead, there was a large open cemetery with multiple funerals taking place. The funerals gathered crowds of many strangers, strange and deformed people. He approached the first group of strangers on his right to see who was in the casket, but this group didn't want visitors. Speechless, they pushed him, they spit on him, and they pulled his hair, trying to protect their dead. But Zack was determined to see. He felt this could have been the answers he was looking for. He was wrong. This was no vision. No answers. He was somehow taken to the real world. But yet his body remained on the floor next to the head that he butchered. He powered his way through the marsh of angry people and finally, a small glance of inside the coffin. The smallest vessel made from old, worn, rugged wood, embroidered with crimson blood and white fabric. A young boy's battered and bruised carcass lay inside. The boy was still alive. Wrists and ankles were bound with rope. His mouth muffled by a dirty rag that was forced inside. Zack became sickened as the crowd continued to push him away. Punches to the face. More spitting. They forced him to leave. He had never been assaulted before. This was the first time that he was not thinking about his cocaine. Thoughts of his cold demise until he remembered that the goddesses told him that he would find Sebastian. So now he was motivated and encouraged to keep moving forward. The next funeral, to his left, a much larger group of grieving hearts. As he merged toward the crowd, Zack was warmly greeted and welcomed by the funeral goers. Come this way. It's time to pay your respects to the dead. An old senile man spoke as he pointed to the casket. Zack felt accepted and turned in the direction of the pointed finger. Before he moved forward, tiny, wrinkled fingers peeked out from inside, grasping onto the edge of the casket. What the fuck? Here we go again. Shit is about to get real. Zack mumbled out loud. Stepping closer, he saw the most gruesome visual he had ever seen. All the cocaine and acid that he had done in his life had often caused him to have epic, gory hallucinations. But this had gone too far. Inside the coffin of madness, dripping with blood, a newborn baby boy. Purple, thick, pulsing veins laced its bald head. An evil grin was plastered on its lips. Still attached to the umbilical cord, coming out of a young Indian woman, looks to be about 25 years old, who was apparently dead. She wore a black gown with expensive ancient jewels wrapped around her neck. Blood and dirt coped the inside of the casket along with globs of pus and clear sticky residue dripping from the demonic baby. Zack was in awe. He felt speechless, then became nauseous 
with anxiety. Boiling, cold sweat oozed from his pores. To keep from puking, he ran from the horror scene. Close by, he saw another casket. A closed casket. No one was around. Feeling relieved that no one was watching him, Zack edged closer. Looking around with caution, he was free to look inside. How bad can it be? How much worse can it possibly get? He took a deep breath as he opened the lonesome casket. Holy fuck! His words escaped his mouth. Immediately, a hand lunged out, wrapping around his neck. It was himself. He was the one in the casket. A duplicate Zack, which was far stronger than he was. As many drugs that had consumed his life, he had never been choked out by himself. Until now. Chapter 12 Brothers No More All who were born on the Red Mountain did not age past ten years old. Gemini twins Fame and Joseph were the original children of mourning. Identical twins on the exterior, but completely opposite on the inside. Together, they led the abandoned and forgotten children until Joseph's chaotic ways brought him down a much different path. Growing in strength, knowledge, and wisdom, they released themselves from the Red Spider's cursed church. Fane was just compassionate, a fair leader filled with religion and politics. But Joseph thrived on anarchy, which built a wall between the two brothers. Countless years later, Joseph stepped down as co-leader, vanishing to explore the mountain's evil. They were brothers no more. Joseph felt hunger for evil and thirst for power as his solitude became his pathetic life. On his journey to find the root of the mountain, he nourished his body by eating mice, rabbits, and even snakes, piece by piece. He was turned on by eating animals alive, feeling their bones crush between his sharp teeth with each bloody bite. He had always enjoyed the act of torture, the act of control. He wanted to be a part of the world's suffering. He was convinced that he was going to find and end Sebastian. He was certain of this. I'm going to kill this motherfucker. He repeated constantly to keep himself motivated. Sebastian was a name that everyone knew, but no one seemed to know why. No one knew where to find him. Is he even on this mountain? Joseph was going to find the answers to the mystery that surrounded the Red Mountain. Hello, old friend. A familiar voice behind him scared the fuck out of 
Down here. He looked behind him on the ground. Was a small yellow spider. Remember me? Joseph recognized the subtle voice from the haunted church years ago. I told you I am everything. I am everywhere. I know all. Joseph almost felt happy to see him. Then who are you? Who is this Sebastian? Where the fuck is he? I am Ash. I was the first to find the mountain. And Sebastian is my son. I know exactly where he is. He is right where I put him. Joseph was skeptical because this spider had cursed him and his entire village. Death and wickedness is all he was after and felt that maybe Ash was the only way. Take me to your son. First you must learn the truth, then you will see for yourself. Ash appeared in his true form. A hulk-sized creature with arms of massive muscle and thick veins of steel. His skin was dark, with burnt scabs scaling his flesh. Come, let me show you the truth. Chapter 13 Lies versus Truth Now that he was finally at the well, Jason's journey came to a halt by the wall of children hindering the path. Thousands, maybe more. He thought it could have been possible that even his own children were hidden within the ghostly figures. It was almost midnight and he had lost way too much blood. He was running out of precious time. The storm will have its vengeance. Jason had no idea that his beloved Isabella was behind the storm. But he did know that evil was lurking in the shadows, waiting for him. The ruthless downpour had an alternative effect on him than it had on the doomed Levithions. No acid like rain. No sadness or emotions. But instead, a dark arousal had taken over him. Daunted and frightened, bleeding to death. But all he could think about was her his seductive sorceress. He could taste her on his bitter tongue. Fane, the soul leader of the children, stepped forward. I believe that belongs to us, pointing at the bucket. Jason held the bucket tighter. You don't understand. Get the fuck out of the way. He was desperate. He wasn't going to give up now, even if that meant that he had to fight off or even kill these children. But Fane knew what Jason was thinking. The children of Morning were peaceful, but extremely powerful. What did she say to you to make you believe that you are going to win? We are pure. We do not murder. And you will never find Sebastian. In fact, 
We have found a soldier that will find him and save us all. But all Jason could think about was Isabella's flawless body. Her smooth skin that traced between her legs. Always moist, always hairless. She tasted like strawberry fields of ecstasy. Without thinking twice, he pushed and ran through the crowded children. Many of them were trampled to death. His offense brought him to the well, even if only for a brief moment. Long enough to throw the bucket and all the remains to the bottom, as the children banded together to tackle him to the ground. He felt that they were going to kill him, but he somehow felt vindicated because he had achieved what he was set out to do. Instantly, the ground began to shake and roar, erupting into waves of tremors as the mountain accepted the flesh. Chapter 14 the family tree. As Zack was being strangled by his stronger self, he was quickly reminded about the goddesses wanting to help him. Though he didn't want any more blood on his hands, he knew that this was probably the last time he could ask for help. The Zack that was inside of the coffin released his grasp and melted into the landscape as he laughed away. Coughing, gagging, he started to get his breath back. Screeching noises alarmed him to turn around. His lips were greeted by passionate cocaine-laced kisses from each of the massive statue-like supreme females. We knew you would be calling on us. Did you miss us? Zack could taste the sweet cocaine losing himself in these intoxicating kisses. It seemed forever since he had tasted the drugs. I need answers now, or just send me away, back to my real world. No more games, no more visions of bullshit. I'm trying to help you all, you all chose me. But I will never find Sebastian, not without answers. Their flirting laugh turned him on as he was trying to break free from their kisses, from their naked glowing skin. You are in no position for ultimatums, but you are right. We don't have much time left. No more speaking, just listen. They knew he needed the truth. They began to explain the dynamics of the situation, continuing to feed him cocaine with their kiss, and softly touched his entire body. Hundreds of years ago, a man named Ash and his family ended up on this desolate mountain. An Indian witch doctor on the verge of making a cure for his sick wife. Plants, potions, and the wrong prayers. Ash's mixture opened a permanent gateway. Accidentally, he created a curse far beyond the powers of his control. Two demons had gained access to this wicked portal, taking control of everything. They approached him with a choice. Ash 
was with his deathly wife and his only son. That was the choice. Of course, out of selfishness, he chose his wife, leaving his son to the demons. His son was Sebastian. Eventually, Sebastian had a child, a baby girl. He named her Isabella. He never knew of his father's arrangement with the demons. These heartless demons came to Sebastian in many dreams. They warned him and told him that he must give away any descendants he would ever have. So to keep her safe, he hid his Isabella in a different world to protect her. Ash was given a certain amount of time before the demons would take his soul forever. He must pass the torch to Sebastian. Now that Ash is running out of time, he hid Sebastian from those who are searching for him. Isabella is also looking for him but she doesn't know who he is. Not many of us do. Isabella is dangerous. If she or the Lavisians find him first, they will kill him, along with all chance of survival. Chapter 15 The Beginning of the End Sleeping Isabella awoke to the uproar of arguments just outside the prison walls. She did not realize that she had fallen asleep. We must be at their camp, she thought to herself. Her wrists were bound together, chained to the ceiling in the center of a cold, dark cell. Blinded, her nude flesh shivering from the unwelcoming darkness. She was being watched. She felt warm, musky breath on her exposed skin. Nicodemus cleared his throat before speaking. Don't you worry, you whore. I have your eyes right here. I'm in control now. He folded his arms as he lustfully watched her suffering. He knew just how perverted his people were. Isabella was aware that things were going to get a lot worse. She felt creepy, calloused fingertips exploring every crease every crevice of her suspended body. Many hands were caressing and scratching at her silky skin. They spread her trembling legs and stretched open her petite ass cheeks, forcing large, jagged objects inside of her. With their fists, shards of glass, and splintered wood, penetrating her mortal body. To her, it felt like sandpaper grinding within, as blood pooled deep in her core. As the Levithians took turns raping her again and again, both the men and the woman added to her affliction. As the thousands of men defiled her, the women kept her legs and ass cheeks spread for easy access. The wicked women also scorched her skin with candles and would throw boiling water on her face, melting some of the fragile flesh. Nicodemus was thoroughly enjoying himself as he watched the madness. 
He moved in closer and placed the hard nipple from her left breast between his sharp teeth. Without warning, he bit down, biting her nipple completely off and chewed it, savoring the sweet taste. After the nipple had lost its flavor, he placed it in her mouth, then taped her mouth shut. She began to cough and gag, trying to keep her bloody nipple from sliding down her throat. Come, let's leave her to bleed alone for a few hours. She was in a nightmare world of extreme torture. She fell unconscious again, unable to bear to severe anguish. Chapter 16 Home Sweet Home Silence fell over the Red Mountain, exposing the peaceful Mother Nature. No animals, water, or trees, not even the wind, could conjure up sound. A wicked darkness began to saturate the ambient undertones of the morbid sky. The crystal moon and its elegant stars diminished into the cursed night. Small drops of fluorescent blood began to drip from the great unknown. Spirits and skeletons moan and cry out from beneath the dirt. Ash stood at the peak of the mountain waiting for his final events to unfold. He was ready to give his power to Sebastian. A magnetized sphere hovered over the well, inhaling everything on the mountain into it. Slowly, the animals, the trees, the water, and all human life was being sucked into the pit. The more that filled the well, the deeper the red that stained the mountain. Jason and the children of mourning were already at the foot of the well, so they were the first to go in trying to hold on to the bone structure, but the force was too strong to fight. Zack, on the other side of the mountain, could feel this power drawing him closer. The blood began to rain with brutal speed. All that could be heard was Ash's evil laughter echoing from the mountain tops. Buildings and homes would collapse as they suctioned into the well. Maybe the mountain was purging itself, is exactly what Isabella was thinking, as an ounce of hope rose up inside of her. The well had devoured almost everything by now. The Levithions and the children, and even the rogue Joseph, gone. But the magical sphere had specifically brought Zack and Isabella before the powerful Ash. I will show you the truth. I will show you, Sebastian. But I have his tongue. He will not be able to speak. Ash declared his honesty. Lips melted together. Sebastian appeared while Ash explained. I made the way for us all to join forever. This is our home now. I was just trying to save my dying wife. But instead, I had destroyed everything in the process. Isabella, you are 
for Sebastian's daughter, my granddaughter, born over 200 years ago. Unfortunately, all of Sebastian's descendants were cursed to die. Many years later, in fact, 18 years ago, Sebastian had another child in a different world. A boy. Yes, that boy was you, Zach. Now the three of us must be locked inside of the weather so that Sebastian can absorb all of my power to defeat this mountain. We must all forfeit our lives before Sebastian becomes the Red Mountain. Instantaneously, the three of them were sucked into the well as it imploded in on itself. Until this very day, Ash's haunting laughter can be heard to all who visit the Red Mountain.